We are looking at the British empiricist George Barclay, and yes, it is pronounced Barclay, even though the town of Berkeley, California, is named after him. We have two different pronunciations, one for the person, one for the town. Now, the uh, dates there are relevant in the sense that his work was after that of John Locke, and we can see as we go on the influence of John Locke on his ideas, his epistemological viewpoint is called idealism, and we'll explore why. So idealism, the thesis of idealism, could be summed up in the Latin phrase that Barclay used, S-A-S percepi, or per percepi, if you're uh, a little more careful about the Latin there. Uh, this means to be is to perceive or to be perceived. So perceivers, minds that are capable of having perceptions, and their perceptions are all that exist. That's it. There are no material objects that are somehow behind our perceptions. All we have are the perceptions and the people doing the perceiving. Now, that is a metaphysical claim, but it stems from epistemological consideration. So we uh, look at Berkeley in our context uh, with a light of his epistemology. Now, why would somebody say this? Why would somebody say we don't have objects that cause the perceptions that are separate from us, that exist out there somewhere on their own, like it seems natural to believe. Well, Berkeley argues, well, first of all, Locke's variance arguments work. We'll say more about that in just a moment. But what Locke did is he separated secondary qualities from primary qualities. So primary qualities include shape and size and number and motion, those kinds of things. And secondary qualities include, include color, pitches of sounds, uh, sensations of hot and cold, those kinds of things. And, and Barclay asks, how could something have shape or size, but lack a color or a temperature? And that's a rhetorical question. Barclay's answer is, they couldn't. That's not possible. It doesn't make any sense. So if something exists, it must have both primary and secondary qualities. Now, what Locke thought is that objects only have primary qualities. The secondary qualities are things that only exist in our mind. And so Barclay says, you cannot make that distinction. The qualities can't be separated in the way that Locke described. However, Locke was right in his reasoning process for claiming that secondary qualities for in, are in the mind. They do, in fact, depend on our mind. It, but both of them, both primary and secondary qualities, depend on our mind. So that's one reason we have that impossibility of the primary qualities existing without the secondary qualities. For reason number two here, let's go back to the original variance argument for, of Locke. So Barclay says these arguments work. They are good arguments that Locke used. The sensations of hot and cold, the, the flavors of something, the, the sense of smell that we have, these, these vary according to what's going on in our mind, so they only exist in our mind. That was roughly Locke's argument. If you recall, uh, you should look at that video if you've not yet, the color of the screen, the little experiment we did within that video, uh, the, the water being hot to one hand and cold to the other hand. And Barclay says, you know, those kinds of arguments work for primary quality. So the shape of something actually does depend on our perception. What might appear square from a straight on pers perspective might be a trapezoid from an angle. Size does depend on our perception. If you're up really close to a, a clock on the wall, it's, you know, as big as a pizza maybe. 
But if you stand far away and then put your thumb up in front of your eye, your thumb can cover the entire clock. So size, you know, how big is the clock? Is it smaller than the thumb or bigger than the thumb? Right, size depends on our perception. Motion is the same way. Some things are in motion. If we're in motion, they appear not to be in motion. Right, and some things appear to be in motion when they're not because of us. So size, shape, motion, even number depends on our perspective. Think about it this way. If you have a row of trees that you're looking down from one angle, you can count the trees. But if you lined yourself up with the angle, you only see one tree. So uh, all of these primary qualities depend on our perspective. So what Barclay is doing is he's pushing Locke to the logical conclusion. He's using Locke's arguments. He says the arguments are good, they make sense, but they need to be applied to primary qualities. And Barclay is in fact concerned about being stuck in an internal perspective like Descartes was. So uh, Barclay's influenced by Descartes as well. Descartes, uh, you know, when he, when he, did his arguments, his skeptical arguments, he got to the point of cogito ergo sum, and he was convinced that he exists, but then he built up his world after that in a, in a way that you should see if you haven't seen the Descartes video. Uh, but Barclay is, has that perspective and recognition of our mind and the things that we perceive. And then he says, well, how could anything be more reliable than what's within our mind? Now, on this point, he agrees with Descartes. However, he says, that's all we have, right? You cannot possibly get outside of your mind. That's all we have. Our experiences are all within us. And so there is no material world out there to get at. Again. How could you be outside of your mind to affirm a material world if all we have are perceptions? That's what we experience, so that's all that exists. So let's put this in a, an argument. So we say that the variance argument works for primary quality. So how does this go? Let's think about it now as, as you're watching the video. The shape of the screen, if you're watching on a phone or a, or a tablet of some kind or a computer monitor, uh, you probably have a rectangular screen in front of you. Well, the shape of that screen depends on your perception. Because if you tilt it in one direction or another, it's no longer a perfect triangle with 90 degrees as a triangle. Rectangle with 90 degree angles right? It's more trapezoidal on some angles. So the shape of the screen actually depends on our perception. And if something depends on our perception, then it's an object of perception. That's just kind of a definition there. And so the screen is an object of perception, right? And objects of perception are what we perceive. Those are the things that we perceive. What we perceive exists in our minds. So objects of perceptions, the things we perceive, are things that we exist in our that exist in our minds. That's what we have. Perceptions. So we conclude that screens exist in our minds. We have no reason to think they exist anywhere else, says Barclay. And in fact, Barclay says it goes against common sense to speculate on what might exist beyond our perceptions or outside of our minds, right? Somebody would have to be out of their mind to think there are such things. We cannot speak of any so-called matter, something that I don't know anything about, says Barclay. And so Barclay is presenting his ideas in a dialogue. In his dialogue, we have a couple uh, people conversing. Hylus is actually from the Greek word for matter, and philonus, the, the noose part of that, is for mind. Of course, philo means love. Uh, so we have the person uh, defending matter and philonus defending Barclay's view. And Hylus has heard that philonus 
denies the existence of matter. So he's concerned about Philonus, and Hylas thinks Philonus has gone crazy. So he comes and he asks him, how can you ex deny the existence of sensible things? And Philonus says, what are you talking about? What are sensible things? Those are things we perceive with the senses, correct? And Hylas agrees with that question, yes, certainly. And Philonus says, look, I don't deny that we perceive objects. They are sensed immediately. They are unlike, for example, what we perceive when we understand what's going on in a book or we're reading a story or something like that. Those are mediated ideas. So uh, what we're talking about are things sensed directly. And if something is sensed immediately, directly, then we don't sense their cause. All we have is the sensation. So the sensations themselves are in our minds, and that's what sensible objects are. Things that exist in our minds. And so to use a, a wonderfully drawn illustration, when we looked at John Locke's arguments, we considered you know, perceiving a tree and how that works. For Barclay, the tree only exists in a mind, right? That's, that's the only place that, there's just one tree, the tree that exists in our mind. There's no external object causing it. How could we know anything about some external object? Now, there's another argument that Barclay presents, and it has to do with fire. So uh, again, following Locke's arguments, he accepts Locke's conclusion that heat and cold are sensations within us. And then he goes on to say, well, intense heat is pain. That's what intense heat is. So the pain is the sensation we have when we experience intense heat. And that's indistinguishable, right? That they're one and the same. And so both of these things are within our mind. Now, pain cannot be an object outside of us, right? That doesn't make any sense. It can't be something unperceived by us. It must exist in the mind. And so that means everything we know about the fire, for example, its temperature, so to speak, whether it's hot or cold, anything else that we perceive, exists in our mind. And what does that mean? It means the fire exists in our mind. Now this is true of everything else that we perceive, and so this can be applicable to all objects. So everything that we consider a distinct object is actually something that exists in our mind. Now, I mentioned that Barclay considered himself a defender of common sense. What he's saying is, look, we can trust our sense perceptions. Uh, we can know what is real. Our ideas that we have, our ideas within us are real. And this is where the name idealism comes from. It's not some uh, hope or, or plan or, or idea of, of great things happening. He's not an idealist in that sense. He's an idealist in the sense of the things that exist are ideas within us. And that's everything that we perceive. And to speculate on external objects then, that would be to go beyond what our senses are telling us exist. And so that would be speculative and that's unnecessary. What is mind independent? You know, people call this substance, and Barclay says, well, that, what, what would that be? What, what could it be? We couldn't possibly know what that is, something that's mind independent. We are minds. We experience things with our minds. There's no way we can, again, get outside of our mind. To do so would be, we would have to be out of our mind, right? And so there is no mind independent substance. No such things exist. Everything that exists is an idea or a sensation in our mind. Now this conclusion here, this view is 
fairly unpalatable to most people. So what criticism might be raised against this view? So somebody might say something like this to Barclay. Well, Barclay, what about the things that aren't perceived right now? So what about the rocks on Mars before our Mars rover got there? Did they not exist? And then suddenly when we sent the rover there and then we could perceive them, then they popped into existence? Your, your view is kind of crazy like that. And Barclay's response is, oh no, I, I, I deny that they weren't perceived because God saw them. In fact, this is an argument for the existence of God. We need not go into uh, that, how that works exactly, but you can see, right? So Barclay says, because we know that these things exist without being perceived by humans, then there must be a perceiver that continues to perceive them, and that would be God. And uh, Barclay describes a limerick from his days. Now, uh, usually limericks are, are not quite the tasteful things that we include in a lecture, but this one is perfectly acceptable. There was a young man who said, God must find it exceedingly odd when he finds that the tree continues to be when no one's around in the quad. Dear sir, your astonishment's odd. I'm always about in the quad. And that's why the tree continues to be, since observed by yours faithfully, God. And so that's, that's Barclay's response. He was well aware of the criticism we just mentioned, and that's his response to the criticism. Now, you may have your own criticisms, but I will leave them to you to ponder.